problem money or is the problem food? It's both. There's uh, there's probably enough food right now to feed the people at reasonable levels, but the problem is distribution. And uh, in but you, I have never been interested in equitable distribution of poverty. You've got to produce something that's worth something to the general public before you worry about distributing it. Poverty is not one of those items. Food is. And uh, this is where we forget that even in our own fluent USA society, you go down to some of the uh, barrios or some of the low-income sections, and even now, you can see hungry people. There are many reasons for those people living, being left behind. But if we had the will to change that, we could. We have the resources to do it. But in the third world, food deficit countries, they don't have these resources. But if we are interested in world uh, peaceful or uh, tranquil conditions for your our sons and daughters and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. It won't be built on empty stomachs and human misery. And remember that when you have this widespread misery in many of the African countries and still in Asian countries, it's very fertile ground for planting seeds of disruption by extremists. Uh-huh. If you, uh, what do you think? Well, you know, I'm going to wait till uh, to, to after a break for this because there's a few uh, big topics I want to get to. Uh, I want to remind people that uh, uh, our guest is Dr. Norman Borlaug, 92 years old, won the Nobel Peace Prize in uh, 1970 and is considered uh, by I think everyone to be uh, the man who fed the world and that's the name of the book by uh, Leon Hesser Uh, if you know the lyrics to one pop song that you've heard in your life if you can recite the lyrics to any song done by the Beatles done by anyone anywhere you know too much about (laughs) music and too little about your world please learn about uh, Dr. Norman Borlaug Uh, it's a a mind blowing story and it's amazing that we're sharing the same uh, time with with, with a man this great we'll be back after this 866-570-PEN 7366 we'll be back talking to the man who fed the world and he's taking time probably doing this show he's killing hundreds of people that he didn't work on saving (laughs) we'll be back Yeah, this is uh, Penn Gillette at 866-570-PEN-7366. You know, uh, I said at the beginning of the show I was going to be uh, taking calls, and uh, we're not, because yeah. I'm I'm so excited to be talking to uh, Dr. Norman Borlaug that I'm, I'm simply greedy. And uh, we also have Leon Hesser, who wrote the book, uh, The Man Who Fed the World. Both Godot and I have read it. Uh, I don't know how it's possible that uh, uh, there are people in... It seems like if you know one name of one person uh, alive today, the name should be uh, Dr. Norman Borlaug. Uh, because, you know, in, in a place, what I do for a living is talk, and nothing makes talk seem more empty than having Dr. <laughs> Norman Borlaug on the phone. Uh, uh, doctor, are you, are you still uh, working in the, uh, in the field and on this stuff, or have you finally retired? Well, I'm still a part-time employee of three different organizations. One uh, based in Mexico from January until the 1st of September. Uh, This is the Sasakawa African Association. It's funded by a Japanese foundation attempting to improve agriculture in the countries that have been left behind food production. Uh, Second, uh, uh, I'm a consultant to the organization that I spent much of my life with, namely the International Maize Corn and Wheat Improvement Center, uh, just outside of Mexico City. That was where this wheat technology was developed that was moved to the third world in the 60s. 
and I'm a, a part-time consultant to that organization. And in the fall semester, I'm a professor of international agriculture at Texas A&M. So I'm still active. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you haven't just uh, packed up the Winnebago and driving around getting stickers at different uh, national monuments. Uh, oh. Will you explain to uh, uh, people, and maybe uh, maybe uh, Leon, just so uh, just so people know a little more about this? Would you just talk a little bit about what BT wheat is and what uh, golden rice is and how that stuff's put together and, and what what the hopes are for that? Still there, Leon? Uh, yeah, yes, yes. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, I thought uh, that Norman would answer that. The uh, yeah. No, I think you should answer. The, the golden yeah. rice uh, is, uh, through genetic engineering, the uh, scientists have been able to uh, introduce vitamin A. Uh, and in many countries, uh, particularly in Africa, the people are, are uh, deficient in vitamin A. It causes blindness and other kinds of things. This golden rice can solve that uh, very, very easily. Uh, and that's just one example of the kinds of, uh, of research that can be done with uh, genetic engineering and, and genetic modification. Now, now one other, I'd like to transmit one other possibility. For example, it's so-called rust fungi. These are fungi that attack all of our cereal crops except rice. For some reason, way back in there, development millions of years ago when it split off from the same track of wheat and oats and barley and corn and millet and sorghums, it shut the doors on infection, became immune to the rust fungi, the buccinias. And uh, this has been one of the main problems in breeding for disease resistance that has been carried on for decades. And generally, the longevity of a variety with resistance to the many different forms of these organisms that exist in different parts of the uh, wheat gro or uh, cereal growing areas results in that they live, uh, the varieties are useful for 10 or 15 years. The last ones that we put together, these high-yielding dwarf wheats that were used on the Green Revolution in Indian Pakistan and in other parts of the world, have lasted 50 years with resistance. But there's a new strain now available or that appeared in uh, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Kenya. If that gets loose, before we can change the varieties, there could be a disaster. And so one of my uh, long-time hopes with the new biotechnology is take that resistance that's in rice and transfer it to not only wheat, but the other cereal grains.